Welcome to Hanging Out with Hamza. Today we're going to be talking to Eric. Eric is one of my close friends from Houston. Uh, he's a real estate investor in Houston, uh, a real estate agent who also invests in real estate. And uh, we're going to dive deeper into financial literacy, Tesla, since we both love Tesla, and just how to be smart about your finances in general. So uh, with that being said, thanks for listening and stay tuned. This is Hamza, and I'm super happy we get to hang out for a little bit. All right, guys, welcome to Hanging Out with Hamza. Today we have Eric on here. Uh, Eric is going to be talking about all things uh, real estate, but also dive deeper into his love for Tesla and why we both connect on a certain level. Uh, so with that being said, here's Eric. Yeah, man, thanks for having me. Um finally able to make this happen after you know just a few failed it yeah no big deal no big deal um no i appreciate you having me on um yeah i just uh i appreciate you uh driving down all the way to houston man yeah man tell me uh tell the audience about yourself where you come from what's your origin story what origin story guys um no I'm, I'm originally i was born in vietnam and uh i moved to the states when i was about seven okay um yeah no english literally just knew nothing and then we just grew up here obviously immigrant um my single mother raised two kids and then went to college and i did the whole college route of the mold that was laid out for you right you go to school you get a degree and you get a job and hopefully you kiss enough butts to climb up the corporate ladder and become successful or at least that's what was told to us but um, i tried that i graduated in supply chain management uh worked in oil and gas in houston obviously for five years doing procurement Procurement is just like a fancier word of saying like your job is to save the company money. Yeah. Right. So any project I was on, whatever the company needed to buy for that specific project, my job is in the procurement department is to basically get that material or services from A to B the cheapest way. Okay. Possible, right. Um, so I did that for about five years. Uh, I was naive and uh, oil and gas, I don't know if you know, but it's very cyclical in Houston, right? When it's great, it's really great. And when it's bad, it's really bad. Right? Yeah downturns it's more like hey there's a layoff your cubicle partner is going to be laid off the one that was sitting next to you doing half your job now i want you to assume that guy's role with no extra compensation so um i meant that i was naive because the company that i was with we went through like two acquisitions right and i'm a hopeless romantic i was like i'll stay with you honey through these two acquisitions i'll ride the storm and um whenever a company gets bought out by another company twice everything that was promised to you in terms of like your career progression ladder kind of goes out the window so hey remember all that hard work you did to get to a b c d e that's no longer there for you right um so after five years i was like i'm not really progressing at the rate that i would like to be um so i didn't want to wait for a company to give me that opportunity so uh funny how i got introduced to real estate is my boss at the time is a part-time real estate agent ironically because his mother was a, a real estate agent so he worked for his mom and he just kind of dropped the idea in my head about real estate and he kind of come in on a weekend like yeah I, I did this i helped a family buy this house yada 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 so it planted the thought in my head but i never really um looked much into real estate and once he planted that thought in my head i went home and i went on the google machine and then i was like this is actually not a bad opportunity for me to do what i like to do because Keep in mind, my job as a real estate agent is to negotiate. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's the same skill set that I applied in my nine to five work job. But um, instead of saving a big corporation, oil and gas, hundreds of thousands of dollars each project, and then just to have the vice president come to you and like, hey, good job, go do it again. Um, I get to save thousands of dollars for, you know, my clients, uh, and obviously in terms of their house and um, the impact, I feel like that leaves behind is a lot more uh, rewarding, right? Mm -hmm. it's a lot, and it's a lot more appreciated as well. Yeah. And then when you went into real estate, do you feel like there were, I know you said there was a lot of skill sets you can carry over. Are there any new skill sets you had to develop or challenges you faced along the way that you felt like made you question your choice at that point? Yeah, a ton. So I, I've been doing real estate now. This is, uh, I've been doing it for six years. This is going on to my seventh year. Yeah. And uh, what I've learned, man, is like, I think when you first jump into this industry to make a name for yourself, it's always like, and you think of this in negotiations, right? It's like, how do I get the best deal for my client? And like, how do I find the best deal? Um, and oftentimes you pit it like that agent versus me, right? Or that seller versus my buyer or my seller versus the buyer. Um, what I've learned now is like, 
it's a lot easier when you work together and you have a more cohesive relationships in terms of negotiations. Obviously, there are things that the seller wants. There are things that the buyer wants in this situation. Um, how do we come to that middle ground? And you work a lot more efficiently going about it that way versus looking at everything from a perspective of like, I got to do what's best for my client. It's yeah. my client only. I mean, of course, it's your job to do what's best for your client. But yeah. at the same time, it has to be a give and take situation, right? Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, especially in the last couple of years, real estate has become a much more focused industry, especially people going into it, uh, real estate agents. I've, you know, I live in Austin, so there's a big market for that. Um, I think there's also levels to it, though. Do you feel like the entryway to become a real estate agent now is harder than it used to be, or is it easier because of everything we have? No, that's a good Um it's super easy to get into real estate. So it's the, like an easy is, entry way, but it's this, hard to grow, right? Exactly. So yeah. So the entry, the entry of barrier, the barrier of entry is uh, very low. Yeah. Right? To get your license, what does that entail for anybody curious, right? Yeah. Now? Yeah. So there's a bunch of real estate schools online. Also, they do um, on campus. I took on campus because me doing online classes is not my strong, right. strong suit. So um, you devote like for me, I devoted literally five weeks of just going straight to class Saturday, Sundays. Um, cost you about 1300 bucks to get your license here in Houston. Um, and then you're now supposed to be a licensed professional to help somebody make a purchase of 300, 400, 500,000 dollars. Yeah. Um, so for me, like that's the low barrier of entry, right? Um, the difference is to be able to be really successful at this, this job and, uh, this industry is like, that's such a low bar. Right. And then now I'm supposed to trust you to help me buy a half a million dollar asset. Right. That's not a job that's to be taken lightly, one. So a lot of the agents, what their pitfall is typically is they jump into real estate and because they've heard it from a friend or they see it online and they see a lot of success in it, but they don't see the back end work, what it takes, right? Honing the craft of like literally understanding when I show a house, I'm not just showing, hey, this is a three bedroom, two and a half bed house, but showing the things that aren't visible to the eye, to the buyer, right? Yeah. Um, and then for us, what we do here is just Financing is a really big uh, foundation of what we do, right? Educating our buyers um, on financing, um, the local lending incentives that are here in Houston to kind of help them make a better informed decision, right? A lot of buyers don't, don't realize that there are so many options. Right. As a buyer, when you're going and getting a home loan or applying for a home loan, like, and there's so many great programs around Houston that incentivize you um, with down payment assistance or closing cost assistance, it's just all sorts of programs. So it's my job as an agent to um, go out and network with different banks, different mortgage brokers to find these products for my clients and then being able to bring that back, offering that to the client and then being able to explain that. Is that something you learn while you're taking school or is that something you had to teach yourself on the side? Yeah, this is not taught to any agent. Okay. So typically in school, you're just taught. The hey, basics. So yeah, basics. You, you got to learn how to run the comps to see if this is a good deal for the buyer. Um, here's your buyer representation form. I do things a little bit unorthodox in that way. I don't really yeah. follow the instructions that were given me by school. But for me, I just put myself in the position of if, if I'm a home buyer, if I'm a seller, what are the things that I need from an agent? And that's what I focus on. So for me, it's all about value add, right? Um, same thing with the content that you put out like this podcast. I think, I think it's great because there's so many walks of life and it's what can I bring to the con end consumer or your client that they just can't Google or yeah. it's not on the surface, right? Yeah. And that's why I connected with you. Uh, Eric and I originally met at a random, uh, there was a crawfish broil at one of our mutual yeah. friends place. And we just started talking about our professions. And it's funny because I think we come from two completely different backgrounds and two completely different professions, but we have the same mindset and it's that kind of work ethic and also that approach to human like morality of like, you know, taking care of your patient or your yeah. customer yeah. and approaching it from that perspective in an industry where we're so profit driven, which with any profit driven business, you lose a lot of that uh, human like connection because you're just trying to make that quick buck. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what sets you apart with your industry is you actually, I feel like have a good relationship with all your clients. And when I see your reels and videos, you're very personable with them. Uh, and that's what's great. So, yeah, I mean, besides that, I definitely wanted to have you on here, you know, to kind of express that and what sets you apart, um, you know, not to drag anybody that might be listening to this that just got into real estate. But I do think it's become an industry that people just go into thinking like, OK, I'm going to get in there and make quick bucks. Yeah. And it's super easy. But like you said, there's so many other variables 
to get on top of that or just climb that ladder of real estate. And it's getting more challenging, I'm assuming, with the rates going up and everything right now. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you brought up a really good point. Man, we touched on a lot of good points that I, I tend to kind of overlook just because I'm in the industry for so long. But, yeah. um, you know, being an, an agent uh, in this industry, it's like you can. There are agents who get by like that, right? Yeah. Very transactional. That's what I call them, you know. Once you're done, you're like, hey, thank you so much. So yeah, later, you ever see that. Trusting me with the process. You've seen all these. Right. It's the same folks, right? Thank you for trusting me with the process. And I think if that's how you want to build your business, that's fine. But for me, I've always focused on around like being really centric and like focusing on the relationship. Because right. really, at the end of the day, my job is just managing relationships. Same thing with you, honestly, right? As a business owner, as a dentist, having your own practice, it's, yeah, you can capitalize on one cleaning and whatever the case is, but how do you develop that relationship to where it's like an honest, genuine relationship and they do want to come back and you do genuinely want to help them because a lot of my clients, they're all repeat clients. Yeah. And that's just treating people like people, right? When they're done, like I just, I want to make sure I obviously congratulate my buyers and my sellers. And then I keep in touch, literally I touch base. Yeah. And that's just, it's a real relationship. I, yeah. I build a bond with these people. And the cool part of my job is like, I get to be involved in their lives after the fact. And a lot of my clients now, like I help them sell their house to buy their new house to start their family. Yeah. And now they're on to their second, third kid. And yeah. I got to be a part of all of that, which for me, it's super rewarding. Um, but that's like the, for me, that's honestly, that's one of the best parts of my job and saving them money and then giving them a deal and negotiating on their behalf. is just kind of like a byproduct. But if you run your business, no matter what you do, real estate, whatever you do, I think if you really focus on the people, right. And, and really fostering that relationship and building that yeah. um, community, They'll take care of you. And I, I think that's how life works. Too. Yeah. Do you feel like getting into this industry um, was a challenge uh, without networking with people? Do you feel like this is an industry where you need a mentor or was it something that you kind of built by yourself and you met people along the way? Like what was the like what was the driving factor behind your success and where you are now? Yeah, I can't speak for everyone, but for me, it's like it's just my nature. Whatever I do, I, I really want to do it to the best of my ability. Right. I never want to have, can I curse on you? Yeah. I don't want to half ass anything, right? Yeah. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it all the way. Um, so for me, how I, how I grew and how I started trying to learn real estate was I joined a team and I just latched on to the top producer on the team. Right. And this is right. the trust that you're at. Uh, well, I started off at another Tom company. Yeah. Okay. So I've been with trust now for about three years. Um, but I started off another small boutique for like trust. And I just looked at who was the top producer. And, yeah. Um, and then I tried to learn what their skill sets were because I think you could do whatever you want in here, right? I don't think there's anything that I possess that's better than anybody else. And I don't, vice versa, I don't think there's anything that a top producer possess that I can't learn yeah. or achieve, right? But that's what I meant by like when I said earlier, like honing your skill set, right? Like latch on to those top performers and then identify what skill set that they have and they exhibit that you can take. And maybe you don't like the way they do one thing, but the way they do the other thing is like, really, really cool. Yeah. Right? And you can incorporate that into your day to day life. Um, and that's how I've always done it. Like yeah. Anything I do, I just, I think that's with any industry, if you really want to be successful, I don't think you need a mentor per se, but if you can find one that you can bring value to that mentor, right? Yeah. Cause that mentor is giving you time right. and energy. So what can you give that mentor back to, to, to that build that? Right. So, um, that's how I was able to build my business and yeah. Um, the community part, the networking part is really important. Sure. I think the other hard thing that you brought up is you left one industry to go to a completely different one, you know, from going from oil and gas to real estate. Yeah. I think the problem a lot of people have, which I'm the same, I recently quit a job and I was unemployed for like a month or two. And it's a scary situation because sometimes you have to take that leap of faith and leave it. So was there a tipping point that made you ultimately decide to leave? I know you mentioned, you know, you were working multiple things and getting paid the same, but was there that one day you woke up and you're like, all right, I'm doing it today. No, that's good. Uh, for me, it's coming to America. It's 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 a it's a crazy adventure, right? Like I, right. I was a kid from Vietnam and um, not knowing the environment, not not having any family, just other than my mom and my brother here. So yeah. for me, I had set a goal at a very very young age. At a certain time in my life, it's a very long term goal. I, I wanted to be at this income bracket and have to be able to achieve this in order to turn, take care of my mom. And that's the end goal, right? The end yeah. goal is to take care of my family and take care of my mom who's literally sacrificed everything to get me here. So that mindset has always been in me since I was a kid. And uh, the number that I had in my mind, it, I wasn't getting there. And in, in the time that the oil and gas 
a career allowed me to get there, right? I looked like two, three years ahead and I asked myself, hey, if you're on this trajectory, can you get there? And I just didn't see it. So yeah. when I started looking into real estate, I started to look at the successful real estate agents. And that's when it came down. That's what I meant when I was like, there's nothing that someone else has that you can't learn or become good at. Yeah. Right? You just have to put in the time and the research and effort. And real estate, I feel like, has a lot of freedom in terms of you can make this much or you can make this much. And it's the difference is how much work you're willing to put into it or how much you're willing to get to that level. Whereas with certain jobs, I feel like there's always like a ceiling or something depending yeah. on you know the position you have and whatnot. So yeah, that's true. That's why I I chose real estate is because you know my oil and gas job. I'm I'm the kind of employee where it's not like, hey, I come to work, I do my job and pay me and I'm good. Yeah. I'm the kind of employee where it's like, hey, I'm going to come do my job and I'm going to do it really, really well. Yeah. So when it came time to assume like two roles in the oil and gas route, two roles, like I was able to do that. Yeah. I'll do that for you for three to six months. I'll yeah. prove with data, right? I'm like yeah. a data person. I'll prove to you that, hey, I'm able to do both roles efficiently. But after six months, I'm going to want my pay. Right. You get I, your I, word. I, I don't just... I'm grateful to have a job, but you should also be grateful to an employee. But corporations don't care yeah. about that, right? Corporations, you're just a bottom number. Yeah. So, right. Um, I think once I learned that, and like, you really don't matter in a corporation. Yeah. So. That's, I mean, that's why people get so burnt out, especially in corporate America. And it's really sad because, yeah, I'm hoping that anybody listening to this who's at that verge of wanting to leave to do something bigger or take that leap of faith hopefully get some inspiration from what you did. And I mean, I think it's also the immigrant mindset that we have, like our parents, both of our parents, like came to America with nothing, you know, like they kind of start fresh. And it's that mindset that like, if they were able to do that with no internet, no, yeah, no iPhones, like none no of these universe have. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible that they were able to achieve what they have. Yeah. And so we have no excuse in that regard. So yeah. I think we're kind of spoiled in that extent to, to have that ability to see it already happen. I often think about that, man, because the immigrant mentality is a real thing. Yeah. Right? Because if our parents, we didn't make anything of ourselves, I think everything that our parents sacrificed would be for nothing. Yeah. And I think that weighs on our shoulders a lot. Yeah. Um, it's a gift and a curse, I think. Like It is. I love it. Yeah. I love I, I love it, um, having that much pressure. But uh, yeah. oftentimes ask like the new generation, like where, where do, how do they, ins how do we instill that in them? And I'm like, where do they find the motivation on the drive? Because I often don't see it. Yeah. Right? Everything now is just they don't have instant something gratification, right? They right. don't understand putting the work. And it takes years to get here. Yeah. It's not like I just woke up and became successful. And my first year, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I give a lot of credit to my girlfriend at the time, uh, now fiance. And um, to leave that nine to five job, and I had a, I had a decent salary, right? And in retrospect, I had a decent salary. I had health benefits. Um, to leave that to a job that's pure commission, Right. Doesn't matter how many hours you work, doesn't matter what you do, it's you're you're only as good as your, your last transaction or yeah. cases. But like to get that courage to jump, I, I did at the time, uh my girlfriend was a nurse and um I looked at her, I was like, Hey, I'm thinking about making this transition and I have X amount saved. This is what I would recommend to anybody who's thinking about making any kind of career change, uh, whether it was saved or whatever it is that you decide to go into, but have a plan, right? Have right. a reserve set up. I didn't have that big of a reserve. Yeah. I'm more of like, if you push me against the wall, I will thrive. It's right. just the way I am. I've always procrastinated in school. Don't take my advice. Um, but I work well under pressure. So that'd be an amazing I don't know, man. It's probably just me being lazy to study yeah. and just cramming it all night before. But um, she, I was like, hey, if I need you to work overtime and like float the bills at the time, are you able to do that? And because uh, I need at least two solid years, I need a solid crack at this, right? Uh, I know I'm not going to succeed my first year. Yeah. You've got to understand that. Right? Yeah. Um, she was like, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to do that. Keep in mind, she was only working for one more year. And then she started grad school um, for her graduate program. And that takes three years. So she's going to be out of a job for three years. Yeah. So it's like, hey, by the way, you have one year of this. If you don't succeed, I don't have a job. Like, yeah. I'm not going to be working, right? No pressure. So my first year, we really transparent. My first year, I made like below forty thousand. Um, I was only an agent for nine months. I did about nine deals in those nine months, and um, it didn't yield much. But I knew that I was on the right path. I was making the right relationships, and I was building. Like I understood that. Yeah, right now this sucks, and it's not. Uh, 
it's not ideally where I, I, I was hoping to be at the end of the year, but I knew that like, like no one good at their job is right. good at it the first year. I'm sure your first year of dental practice yeah. wasn't the prettiest. We won't talk about it, but it wasn't the prettiest. And same thing with me, right? I look back at some of my first um, trend. I was great. Just to, just that I was just perfect, for that record, perfectionist. Um, no, but for me, like I knew that there was something there. Yeah. And I told her, I was like, there's something here. Like I've only been doing it for nine months and on average, your average agent sells about two to four houses a year. Oh, wow. Um, and I was at nine, right? And I was only- And you're in Houston, so I'm assuming like, you know, the property value is also not that high compared to other cities. That- yeah, I can't. Yeah, for Austin, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I've looked at other markets too. Dallas is another crazy, uh, rapidly growing um, city. But for Houston, I just, you know me, I'm a big Houstonian. I'm a big, uh, I have a lot of pride for the city just yeah. because I love food. I think you and I share that, that right. same uh, love for food. And everywhere that I go, and the more that I get to travel outside the U.S. and even around the U.S., one thing is constant, man. And yeah. I'll, I'll go to battle with anybody. The food scene here is just incredible. Yeah, I don't right. disagree. That's even moving to Chicago and living in Austin. I realized it more and more living in those cities, how just diverse Houston is with their food and just the amount of hole in the walls you can find here versus any other city is just incredible. And yeah, and I think that, that's the say like with our diversity. Yeah, it's you can literally find any kind of cuisine mostly here yeah and you can find an authentic place that serves that cuisine right i think the only other place that's like really rivals us is like obviously new york right they're super yeah. diverse and in california too we get a lot of inspiration from california but even those they're like more upscale restaurants and whatnot here you can go to like a, a mom and pop literally like a gas station restaurant and have like some quality food something that might not pass food inspections yeah food exactly yeah but um yeah i wanted to kind of dive into the the financial literacy part of it, because you mentioned having a certain amount of money kind of set aside. And I've learned that too, you know, there's this thing called lazy money and there's this thing called, you know, like active investment, passive, all this other stuff. So I, I've dug your brain about this stuff before, not only real estate, but just investing in general and being financially illiterate. And I think you're a good resource for that. And since I already had real estate agents, I wanted to kind of step away from that because we've already covered a lot of that. But there is still a lot of um, just lessons you've learned along the way working in this kind of capacity. So uh, starting off with lazy money or the money you set aside, do you have any advice? Obviously, everybody listening, he's not an accountant. He's not certified to give this advice, but it's just his opinion. And if you'd like to take it as I did, then that's great. I'm so glad you said that. It's going well. It's going to follow it up with a yeah. CPA amount of money. Right. Planner, so this is just based on his personal experience and mine as well. Um, so this is something I wanted to kind of talk about because this is both of our passions too. And every time we hang out, we're always talking about how we can save and make more money at some point. Yeah. So I thought this would be a good thing to kind of share with the with the audience. Um, no, I think it's a big deal for me because in school, right? Like we're not taught any of this stuff. No. No one teaches us about tax. This is... No one tells you, hey, once you become a 1099 or start your own business, it's great that you're making a- ABC money, but like yeah. Uncle Sam's coming for you. They just don't, they don't teach you the stuff. They don't teach you about the taxes. They don't teach you that, hey, starting your own business sounds really grand and awesome, but Uncle Sam's going to come for his cut of the, the money, you know? And it wasn't until I became a real estate agent where I'm a 1099 employee. I think everybody else typically is a W-2 employee. You go to work, you clock in, you clock out, you get a salary, and this is what you get every two weeks. Right. Uh, those two week paycheck, I'm going to collect a few and I'm going to hold it. Right. That's why when people are happy to get money back on their tax return, it wasn't until I got older where I realized that that's a bad thing. Getting money back on your tax return when taxes are due means that they kept too much money from your paycheck. And they said, oops, we kept way too much money. Here's some money. Back. Yeah. Right. And growing up, I was taught like, oh, hey, this is my tax return. Let's go out and spend it. Yeah. That was money that you had. So it wasn't until I, I became a 1099 employee and ran my own business. That you, Do you mind explaining what a 1099 is to yeah so you're just a contracted independent contractor right? yeah, yeah i don't i'm not forced to come into work right uh, at a certain time i'm not forced to leave at a certain time i can yeah. really work from my own home um obviously we have this really pretty, pretty office here but um you're not required to dress a certain way you don't you know it's you're your independent contractor right that's what 1099 is right so wasn't until i became a 1099 independent contractor that structuring the business understanding taxes knowing your tax liabilities, um, speaking with a CPA, um, shout out to Joel, um, that you really start to understand how to form the business entity, um, what kind of tax codes exist to benefit small business owners. I think that's another thing that doesn't 
gets spoken about a lot is um, the system is set up. I hate the way they say this. I think the saying is like, uh, you know, it's meant for the rich to stay rich and the poor to stay poor. I don't believe in that at all. I do think it's very, very um, written in favor of business owners and entrepreneurs, right? Um, but yeah, that's what I mean by financial literacy. They don't teach you this stuff in school. So I had to learn this as I progressed in my career. And uh, that's what I love to share back. So there's a lot of ways to minimize tax liabilities as a business owner and as a home owner and as a real estate investor. And that knowledge, same thing with the way that I've learned about finance. Um, I want to be able to take that, learn it, really understand it, and then give that back to my clients, right? I think that's my duty as an agent. And um, I could show you a house. I don't really care about the house. You know, it's a three bedroom, two and a half bath house. But how do I give my clients the tools um, that they need, right? To really understand and grasp that. And then once you own a house, if you want to later on, turn that house or the many houses that you buy into rental portfolios to then offset your income as a W-2 employee. Because not everyone's a real estate agent. Yeah. You that, right? You're going to be a, I think you're, you're a W-2 employee. No, I'm, a, I'm in a better contract. Yeah, right? Yeah. Right? yeah. But at before, there's no way to offset that income. Yeah. Right? So we have to find out ways to really do that using the code system that exists, the tax laws that exist, and partnering with the CPA. I'm not a CPA branch plan, but um, once you understand that, then... For example, like my house, my office, a lot of people don't know if you use your home office for work as a contractor, you're able to deduct a certain amount of square footage from your home, right? Minimizing your tax liabilities. Layman's term minimizing your tax liabilities means if I make $100,000 a year and it costs me $60,000 to do my business, whether whatever it is, whether it's marketing, um, I invest in cameras, this microphone, this equipment, instead of Uncle Sam being able to tax me on $100,000, now I'm only being taxed on $40,000. Because right. it costs sixty dollars, right? Um, that's kind of the intricacies of business ownership that no one teaches you in school. And now that I learned it, I want to give that back. Yeah, and that's what I think you and I really, really bonded well because no one talks about this. Stuff. No, it's kind of like a thing that's like it often gets skimmed past by one because people don't know it. And for me, it's like I've always tried to hang around friends that uh, are a lot older than me yeah. and have been through a lot more, so that way. I don't have to make the mistakes myself. I can yeah. just learn it from them and then just apply it. Yeah. I also think people consider it like a faux pas to talk about money and all that stuff. And while like I, I understand, yeah, you're not going to just ask like, hey, how much does your car cost yeah. or all this stuff? But you're just being able to talk about, you know, how you were able to save this much or how you were able to afford this, like what you what steps you took. And I think being able to back and forth on that is a really great way to kind of grow together. Yeah. And uh, I think that's something I always like try to take advantage of knowing what you know. And obviously knowing what I know, I'm always happy to share that, uh, which is not a lot, but um, yeah, going into that, I, I did want to kind of address, you said you set some money aside when you left your job. Is there a way, is there something you advise for people who are considering doing that? Or like, is there a certain percentage you should keep always on the side and certain amount you should invest yeah, your percentage for all that? I think minimum three months, right? For me, I, I didn't, I would say six months to be comfortable, right. right? Because if you're jumping into a new industry where you're brand new and fresh, it's going to take some time. Yeah. And it's going to take some time to build your credibility, no matter what you do, what industry. But in that time, be prepared not to make an income. Yeah. Um, so how do you balance that of one, changing your lifestyle? Because, you know, your lifestyle is going to change. You can't just do everything like you did when you had a W-2 job or a guaranteed paycheck. So... That and then having support system is really important, right? But the six month buffer is what I would say. Minimum three to six months. Okay. And then um, going into buying a house or purchasing a house, do you ever give your clients or anybody advice on how to save up for that or what the best way to approach that is? Yeah, just say in the next year or two, you're planning to buy a house. Yeah, I just had this conversation with a buyer client and uh, their goal is to kind of get into a house in 2025. And, uh, I preach that like there's loan programs that I have kind of what I touched base on in the beginning is that like people think to buy a house, you need 20% down and it's a big, big, big misconception, right? Uh, I have loan programs that you can say as little as 3% down. Yeah. Take a $400,000 house, for example, that's $12,000, right? Um, on top of your down payment, you have closing costs that's associated, factor in another two to two and a half percent. So if it's $400,000 house, factor another eight to $10,000. So 12 plus eight is 20,000. Um, I told them realistically, be ready. I'm going to negotiate a lot of that for them and to try to alleviate that cost, right? 
as much as I can when that time comes. Who knows what the market will be like then? Um, but you want to have a goal that's measurable and attainable, right? They're called SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time Um, I told them, I was like, if your goal is at 2025 to buy a house, we're in 2023, end of the year, 2023, if you have to save 20,000, divide that into your 12 months that we have upcoming, and what does that look like, right? How much do you need to save? Is that yeah. 2,000, a little under 2,000 a month, right? So whatever your goal is, just have specific metrics in place or else your goal is just like this fictitious goal that's yeah. attainable, right? right. Um, I do. I, I sit down with them and I kind of outlined, hey, this is what you need for your down payment. This is what your closing cost looks like. Here are the, the fees associated with the longer ways. Uh, but yeah. So what was the SMART again? It was specific, measurable, specific, attainable. measurable, attainable, realistic, and time. Okay. Let's try to remember that. Okay. So we're done with that aspect of it. Another aspect I think we really connected on was Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, we're both Tesla owners and Tesla fanatics and geeks. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's where we connected mostly on. Uh, so tell me about your love for Tesla and what got you into it. Okay. You uh, had a big part of it. You and um, my friends, Dan and Kathy, I think were the first ones uh, that I've seen with Tesla, right? And I've always thought of like these self-driving cars. I'm a big tech geek too. I think yeah. we have a, a common interest in that. But when I sat in your car, I think you first got it 20... 2020. 2020? Well, it was 2019 at the end of it, yeah. right before 2020. And I sat in your car and you let me drive it. Yeah. I remember this specifically. I met up for coffee or something. You let yeah. me drive it, right? And I drove it. And uh, I looked at you and I, I looked at you and I was like, hey, I'm going to own one of these cars. I'm going to own one of these cars in the future. And I promise you I'm going to own it. And knowing financial literacy, going back on that is like, I understood that this is during COVID too. If I'm going to buy a car, right? I know cars depreciate in value. I know it's just something that I want, right? It, you don't need that crazy of a car, but it's right. really cool tech to have. Toy. It's just a toy, right? So before I bought the car, I wanted to invest in a little bit of company before I bought it, right? So, uh, I, I went into Tesla. I think I bought into Tesla, I think in 2019, 2020 during COVID when the prices kind of tanked. Um, I've never invested money before. I didn't know what investing in stocks even looked like. You know, I went to the University of Houston, uh, YouTube, uh, University of YouTube and talked to a lot of friends that had brokerage accounts that kind of invested in like uh, index funds, right? Uh, but I looked at it as an opportunity to just buy a bunch of Tesla shares at a very discounted rate. Um, I purchased those at a very, very good entry point. And then now it's obviously grown to where it is. And it's not like I made a lot of money by investing in Tesla, but I felt, at least for me, I felt it was a smarter decision before buying a car. That's how I justified it, right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, let me put my money to where it can like at least help grow yeah. money versus just putting it into a car and it having depreciating in value. Um, and it went well, man. I think Tesla, after that, um, they had a three to one split. So every share that I have now, it's obviously, it's, I have three times more, the value gets lower. So that way other people can kind of join in and get yeah. into Tesla. Uh, this week, they're not so great. So if you want to buy a Tesla at a discounted price, they're doing- Yeah, it's a good time. Good time, right? Yeah. Good time. But um, that's what I did. And then I think I reached out to you. I was deciding between like, when I was ready, right, financially, um, I was like, hey man, um, should I get like an older long range Model S with the older technology? Or should, it was a refresh that was kind of coming out at the time. I was like, or should I just buy a loaded Model 3 or should I just get this refresh that's a little bit more? And you talked to me and like, uh, my fiance was like, if you're going to invest this much money, like invest in one that you really love. Yeah. So you don't, don't settle, right? So uh, I'm glad I did never look back. It's a great car. I'm not like a big car person. I've changed my own oil before, but I, I don't, I'm not going to pretend in sitting yeah. I know cars, but it's a great vehicle. Uh, you drive around a lot, which you and I both do and don't want to do thing right yeah. you just want to get in the car you just want to drive it yeah um, you got to change windshield wiper fluid but that's about it yeah what uh what made you pick the s over the other cars was there a specific reason i know you obviously want to invest in something you really love but did you see something in the s that you liked more than the others was well, the refresh okay like, the refresh looked so clean so clean yeah like, so revolutionary at the time right and yeah. uh i was like man it was the price difference was like 15 to 20,000. But yeah. in the grand scheme of things, if you're financing it, it's like, what does that equate to, right? Um, so I, that's, and I really wanted the bigger vehicle. Yeah. And uh, 
yeah, I don't use all the necessarily room that I have, but sometimes when clients are out of town or out of state, yeah, um, I do need the room to take them and their families, right? So it is kind of cool to be able to do that. When uh, people, I guess, ask you what you love about Tesla or what it is about the car that sets it apart from others, because there's probably listeners on here that still haven't been in a Tesla or yeah. don't know what the difference is between having a gas car versus a Tesla. What is it that really sets it apart? Uh, I would say the low maintenance and the speed. Yeah. So I, I drive very, I, I drive very fast. Um, yeah. Speed limit, of course. Um, but I love the speed and the instant torque, which means like literally when you accelerate, the vehicle just takes off. Yeah. Um, charging at your own house is really really nice, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people argue like how much you save over gas versus electric. Like, yeah, you do save money, but yeah. I didn't buy that because I wanted to save money on gas. Yeah. Um. I just like the idea of being able to charge my car every day, getting into it, and then taking off. And it's not like I drive super far. I think if you're driving like Houston to Dallas, sometimes the the charging kind of like deviates you and detours you for a little bit. But that's a mileage on the S. Theoretically, like 400 on that's, the full charge. That's but, really good. Yeah, but you know, we only charge it to 80%. Or whatever, yeah. But yeah, um, theoretically. But the way right. I drive, it's... Yeah, because from, from Houston to Austin, I, I'll... Do it on one full charge. Yeah. So I'll still have 20% left. So you probably have a pretty good amount. But from yeah, here to Dallas, it's probably a bit more challenging. Yeah, and it's really smart how they built the car. And and I'm a big Tesla fanboy. Just the company won, but like the owner. Too, yeah. Right? I think he is just a... That's a hot topic right now. Hot topic, sure. I, don't, I won't get into like the nitty gritty of it, but I think he's just a troll. Yeah. And I like, I like trolls. Especially yeah. at that level of success and that level of wealth. I think it's cool to have someone that's kind of against the grain. Yeah. What uh, do you think about the Cybertruck coming out? <laughs> I want to go to Austin and see you and see this. Yeah. Truck and you can get me in. But yeah. when I first saw the Red Wings, I was like, this is a little. Yeah. This is, I get the hype, right? Right. Prototype. It's polarizing, yeah. but I think that's the cool thing about yeah. this. It's very cool. Well, now that I see it, like, actual, like, on Twitter and yes. or whatever on social, and it looks... Beautiful. It looks great. Dude. Yeah. It looks like a little crazy mad man. You think you'll go from the S to the cyber? No. You're going to keep your S? I love the S. Yeah. I don't have the need for it. Right. If I was like a macho man doing, you know. Did, did you get FSD on yours herself? No. Okay. That's the other issues. I think that their, the amount that they've raised it by has really helped me back wanting to, because they recently had the deal where you could get the next uh, car and transfer your FSD over. That's right. And they kept calling and I was like, oh, should I do it? Should I do it? But it just didn't like the first off, the interest rate is crazy. I didn't want to deal with that because my interest rate is like crazy low right now. Yeah. And then secondly, I was like, it doesn't make sense to get that, especially if the Cybertruck's coming out and they're probably going to refresh a lot of the models like in the next year or two. Uh, so I just didn't justify it. Also, I just think it's really dumb that you can't transfer FSD over. That's like my own. Have you used thing. it? I use FSD all the time. So. Oh, really? You yeah. have it? Yeah. I had, when I you bought it when it was like, obviously, like 3K. It was like not that no brainer. much. Yeah. And so I was like, of course, I'm going to get all this because that's part of having the Tesla, right? That's like part of the reason. And so now I look at it, I think it's like 12K to get everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just insane. And on top of that, you can't transfer that over to your car yeah. if you get another car, which in my opinion is dumb because that incentivizes people to want to get the next Tesla. Or I, don't, I don't understand the reason for it. And, uh, Break it down in layman terms for people who don't know what FSD and autopilot yeah. are. So, uh, full self driving is what FSD is. That's what yeah. a lot of people think of when they see Teslas. Like they drive themselves. It's theoretically, yes, it does drive itself. Like you put in a destination and it will theoretically guide you yeah. there. Um, there's a lot of bumps along the way and it's, there are, it's but, perfect. But I'm on the beta right now and it's actually really good. Yeah. Like, now, yeah. But I think when I first you. tested it, I was like, dude, I'm not going to be this guinea pig. Yeah, I'm glad you that are price. guinea pig. I appreciate you for being yeah, the no problem. points for us. Um, but full self-driving is one thing. And then autopilot now comes standard in all of the Teslas, which right. is, um, they give it like assistant lane cruise control, right? Yeah. But a lot more efficient. Um, it keeps you in your lane. It, Does it do lane switching too? Uh, only on auto, on the, only with full self-driving, okay. uh, which I, I am jealous of. I, yeah. I rented a car recently that had full self-driving and I was just signaling yeah. the autopilot. It does. It. it just took it. And yeah. I was like, Kind of worried, but yeah. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad it did. But um, so autopilot just kind of keeps you in your lane, controls the distance between you and the other car. Uh, and then full self-driving takes takes care of the wheel, which is a uh, very, very scary. Yeah, honestly, the most like incredible thing is how it all works, especially with the beta right now is obviously 
sure you know the dojo and how it collects the data and everything yeah. but just for the audience so i'm currently using full self-driving data which means that this is not released to the public yet but a couple of people or a lot of tesla drivers or owners that have fsd can apply to be a part of this and once they're in the program they can drive their car on fsd and it collects data this data is taken from my car as it's driving on these specific roads selecting all the data that's necessary from those drives and sending it to what's called the dojo which you can imagine is like this just hub or like this this beehive full of information just computer learning and then that same uh, information is then sourced out to every single tesla so any single tesla from then on that drives on that road in that climate whatever weather whatever patterns can now uh it's basically aware of what the conditions were like when i was driving it which is incredible because if you think of how many people have Teslas, how much data is collected, you basically are covering like every single road system under every condition, et cetera. So I think that's what set Tesla apart from a lot of electric vehicle owners because a lot of electric vehicle owners are thinking like, why would I buy a Tesla when I can get a Honda EV or whatever yeah. and all this? And it's like, it, it's not the car, it's the tech behind the car that people really underestimate. And actually you and I are buying a tech yeah, product right. It's not they're not they're not a car manufacturer. They are car manufacturer. Yeah, but what you're buying is for is the technology. Yeah, it's like the Apple computer cars. Like they've been around for such a long time now. They basically mastered the art of electric car uh, technology, and now on top of that, they're improving these standards while other car companies are trying to keep up with them. And they're I, I mean, if I were to give it a a year estimate, I'd say they're 10 years ahead of everyone. So yeah. With battery tech, like the, I think they've reached the peak of battery tech. So now they're trying to figure out ways to enhance it. Yeah. Um, but the tech itself of like, you know, the, the dojo and all this other stuff is incredible. And have I'm you not driven any other EVs? I have. I drove actually the Taycan. Okay. Uh, I drove the e Mercedes EV. Okay. And I drove the Rivian for like a very short thing. But yeah, it's just weird. It's like, they all have really cool perks. I will say the interior of all those other EVs are years ahead of Tesla. I think Tesla, unfortunately, it really lacks in that quality. Yeah. And that's the major downside. But again, like Eric said, we're not buying it for the car. We're buying it for the tech. And I hope they do catch up with that. But I think they're putting a lot of more of their money into the tech. Yeah. What was your experience like? Uh, I know this is your podcast, but I was just curious. What is your experience like with um, the Taycan and uh, the Rivian? Because... When I say I'm a, like a tech nerd, I literally stay at home sometimes and yeah. I'll YouTube you MK videos. Videos. MK, yeah, him yeah. and Marcus Brownlee. And then I just watch like walkthrough videos, yeah. and look at like reviews. I'm not going to trust me. I do all. the same. Yeah. I just nerd out. Exactly. And, What's the interior? I'll like? still watch like Android yeah. phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm never going to own Android. Android. Like the Taycan. Yeah. I love the tactile buttons. Yeah. I love the little fake noise. Yeah, and, exactly. That's the thing I think is like they have these really cool little gimmicky things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I would never buy that car. Like they're fun to drive. They're fun to experience. Like every time I see a friend who has them, I'm super excited for them. Yeah. I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, you didn't get a Tesla. Like, yeah, yeah. Tesla. I mean, it's yeah, like, yeah. no, it's like it's cool that people are transitioning to EV. And I think it's a cool thing to nerd out about with people who before we're not kind of car nerds and now they love this um but at the same time i don't think i can ever not have a tesla now like i was just thinking like next car i get it's going to be very hard to step away from tesla the only other car i'd want to get is a porsche and that's more for like personal car enthusiasts yeah we did not plan this okay we did not plan this so that's so funny that's yeah okay i'll ask you what kind of porsche but uh i'm not at like I'm not an EV or go home kind of guy. Yeah. I'm a both, right? Yeah. Because if you've experienced a freeze here in Texas, yeah, you tough. understand that like it's very tough, right? Yeah. Um, I always want one gas powered car and one electric powered car just to have who knows in what situation. But as an enthusiast, like I said, I'm not a huge car guy, but I have a, I have an admiration. Like I've driven a BMW, I've driven a Porsche. And it's like the mechanics of when you drive that car, the feeling of yeah. when you drive that car. I just... I cannot explain it. Yeah. And until you've driven the hand and like feeling the handling and like how it drives and how you feel while you're driving it. Yeah. Is a reason why. No, I love the, yeah. Anything I, I'm just the type of person like before I buy a shirt, I'll research that shirt for three months or something <laughs> before I buy shoes. Yeah. Like I really love the thought and love that goes into products. Yeah. You buy them and also just the quality. So like I've also tried to minimize what I buy so that it lasts longer. Yeah. Um, so even if I'm spending a couple dollars more, 
at least I know that I'm not gonna have to reinvest in. So like I've stepped away from Zara and fast fashion and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, with the car thing, it's like Porsche, I'd say is at the top of the line yeah. of every automobile. Porsche's decades and decades of literally perfecting the same. Yeah, and they're perfectionists to the point where when you buy your Porsche, you can pick the, the color on the speed dial. Dude, I've gone like, through all of yeah, this. I've can, nerded out on all of this. You can like pick the material choice on the leather. Itching. Yeah, it's insane. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. And also delivery day. You can choose to go to Germany and get it from the manufacturer warehouse and like, you know, it's like a, it's almost an event in your life that yeah. you can experience. And that's something I really want to go through. So, yeah, I love that aspect. Um, and yeah, so going back to the Tesla thing is that's the only other time I'd step away from that. But with that being said, I still think it's hard to not have a Tesla after experiencing it. And I think it's such a beautiful experience to have one because then besides owning a Tesla, my other favorite thing is introducing friends to teslas yeah. because like we i experienced it with you i experienced it with like so many other friends who now have teslas i think i've referred like 10 friends now and it was great because you get a referral network but like besides the benefits of that it's also just knowing that you brought this other friend into like such an enjoyable aspect of driving like it changes everything like people really underestimate just how uh intuitive teslas are like the fact of like walking up to your car opening it getting in and driving it without pulling anything from your pocket, right? Like the concept of not having HC anymore, the concept of the car always being on, like it's not, there's no on button. People are always like, I've had friends call me when they run in Tesla's, they're like, hey, I'm in this car, how do you turn it on? It's crazy because it's like, it's on. You don't have to, it's, they take away these simple life processes from your brain. Yeah. And it's almost dangerous because I drove my mom's car the other day. <laughs> I think I told you I went to the gas station and, or no, I went to, uh, super market and I went in, bought groceries and all did all this stuff. I was in there for probably like an hour and I came back out and my mom had this like gas engine car and the car was still running. The doors were unlocked and like, it was just sitting there like for anybody to steal at that time. See, that's and it just, because I was so spoiled with the Tesla concept of just like not having to do yeah, it. Just get in your car and go. And yeah. I think that's funny you say that. Cause like it, the same thing just happened to a buddy of mine that's on my team. I was walking into here. So he's he's getting ready to buy another. He's looking at the Clash, right? Oh, nice. He has an older P100D. And he put it in the shop and he's looking at this Plaid, really great deal. And the car dealership that is from Mercedes gave him a rental, right? And uh, he parked a rental. It's an E-Class, very nice car. Is that an electric one? No, no, no. It's a gas know. car. Yes. Yeah. So I was walking into the office. I just noticed his car had the taillights on. Right? Yeah. Walked into the office and I was like, some guy out there just left his lights on. I feel really, really bad. Like I said that to the guy and like some team members, right? Yeah. It's like, I feel really bad. Like, it's been on all day, right? And I was like, somebody should, I don't know how to tell the guy. I don't know how to find him. I'm literally saying this to the same guy, right? I walk out and I was like, I was with another uh, team member of mine. And I was like, look, man, that's, that car light is still on. And his name is Brian. He looked at me and he's like, is that Chris's car? And I was like, He's like, that's Chris's rental. And I totally forgot that he had yeah. a rental, right? And I walked up and I see the dealer plates. I opened the door. And like, when I, when I tell you that car was there for the taking, like, Grand Theft Auto, real life, you could have just opened the door, yeah. put it in reverse and left with a nice Mercedes E-Class. And it was there the entire day. Wow. And that speaks to the security here, I guess. But it's funny because we're so spoiled, right? Yeah. And the Teslas have like seven or eight cameras in the vehicle. So yeah. Another thing like that happened in my car, um, I was out one night celebrating a friend's birthday and we're in the Heights and a guy had backed his F-150 into my car while it was parked. Oh man. Drove off. I came out to the car looking like that. And obviously in my first initial instincts, like what, what the fuck? You yeah. Know? And was there, what happened to it? Was there a dent? Oh dude, it was bad. I got to show you. I got to show you. But I don't think I saw it. But um, I don't want you to see it. It's kind of really sad. But Teslas have a Sentry Cam. Let's, it's included in the vehicle, right? Yeah. Instead of having a dash cam they have to buy, it's already included. There's so many cameras. And I literally went back to my, my dash cam footage and I found the time, the date, and it got his license plate oh, wow. to insurance. And there's no argument there. Yeah, like, I don't think you could get that with a lot of the other vehicles yeah. as standard, right? So right. I think they just make it so easy. And I think that's, why we love it so much they they put so much thought into like 
the user experience. Yeah, the interior is very minimalistic, so it's a love or hate it thing. But I think the thought process, kind of what you were talking about, you love to see what thought went into design of the product. It's like, you know, charging a car, it's not, it's going to take 20, 20 ish, 30, even 40 minutes sometimes. Yeah. And they intentionally put these chargers at specific locations where you can get out of your car and walk and kind of grab something to eat. Or if you want to relax in your car, there's like Netflix, there's Hulu. Yeah. There's Zoom on the car now, which is insane. You could take a Zoom call from your car. Yeah. That's like the thought behind that is why I love the product, right? Do, like, the, the Zoom call, does it integrate the camera? Yeah, there's with, a quick camera. Oh, and it works? Your, uh, okay. I haven't tried it yet, but I wasn't sure how that worked with the camera. Full self-driving. I do want to ask you this. I rented a car, like I said, that had full self-driving. Don't text and drive, guys. Um, it does notice that, yeah. It does notice yeah. that, right? Yeah. It, it literally tells me, hey, keep your eyes on the road. Right? No, what it does is it tracks your eye movement. So what if you do, your eyes... don't text and drive. Well, obviously, I never text and drive. Right. I don't sure. know why you would ever assume that. That's pretty offensive that you would think I would do that. Huh. Huh. Yeah. But let's say hypothetically, hypothetically one real estate agent and wanting to text and drive. Right. Hypothetically, if one were to text and drive, it tracks your eye movement. So if your eyes are... Not looking directly straight, <laughs> but they're like looking a little towards the right. Then hypothetically, it tracks that movement. So, so if you were in a, a position, if you were someone who did that, right? If thing. I was somebody like irresponsible who would do something silly like oh, that, okay. that is totally Ick. just gross. Sure. I would wear sunglasses. I'm like me Or <laughs> you could just hold your phone like directly in front of you and just look down a little bit. Uh, or yeah, you could use the little integrated feature, obviously, where you just like, you know, play the text out on there. Uh, sunglasses, huh? Yeah. Also, Crazy, Elon. Crazy. If you're doing FSD, you know how there's a little tug at the wheel to yeah. know that you're awake or something? Sure. Uh, my mentor, Honor Beck, <laughs> who was probably... Let's that out. Let's yeah, that. his wife will not approve of this, but... Uh, if you take, you know, those weights you put around your arm and stuff and when you're running or whatever, yeah. if you put that right there, it'll, it, you won't have to do it the rest of the drive. So I'll take this in bite. that's just something to keep in mind for anybody who wants to tell people what not to do for FSD driving. So that rental car I had, I had no idea cause I don't have, I'm not, I don't have FSD. So yeah. I rented the car and it had it and I was working and driving and, uh, it just like kept beeping. And I thought normally it beeps, Tesla makes you enforces you to put your hands on the wheel yeah. a few seconds to make sure that you're not sleeping and driving and it kept beeping i was like my hands are on the wheel like i don't know why you're beeping at me and it literally said like in red letter was like keep your eyes on the road i was like how do you yeah why are you tracking my eyes right now yeah. <laughs> um and then i just ignored it because i was like what kind of wizardry is this i kept texting i kept driving and i paid attention fully. yeah and uh it just literally said because <laughs> it's no longer <laughs> it's no longer <laughs> yeah that's great. They took it away from me. I mean, that's great though. I think it's that's another thing I think Tesla's really good at is they try to integrate and constantly update the system to fit whatever yeah, whether it's regulatory guidelines or safety issues. People don't know this also is t Tesla's are rated the safest vehicles yeah. in the, the like the world. Like yeah. their crash safety ratings are the highest. Yeah. And that's something Elon even said was like their top priority before everything else. So you know, the vehicles have zero turnover rate. Like yep. you cannot roll okay. over uh, Tesla because the batteries are based on the bottom. And then on top of that, you have the safety tech. So all the sensors, everything are like the highest, like the amount of times, like even when I am paying attention to the road, the amount of times the cars actually save me from like getting close to rear ending someone, because I mean, it, in Houston, the, the, I'm sorry, man, the drivers here are fucking off action. Yeah. And so every time I drive here, I'm stressed out, but a little of that stress is negated by the fact that I'm now driving a Tesla. Yeah. And it, there's been so many times where it saved me from like almost rear ending because it'll just be like everybody's going like 80 and then all of a sudden it's like stop and go traffic. And yeah. It's just crazy. But yeah. that's been great. Um, but yeah, man, I, uh, I'm i glad that we're, uh, we probably sound like so pretentious just talking about no, what you sound like Tesla. little tesla fan yeah like nerds right but that's I, fine it's, I it's hard it. i think owning a tesla in this current like climate of elon and what's been going on yeah. with him that's been kind of an interesting thing and i was always worried because owning a tesla people always assume like oh this guy's like like either rich or pretentious or all this stuff and it's funny because like they're not that expensive when you compare them to other cars for what you're getting the bang for buck yeah um so i was always wondering worried about where you know how every car has like a uh, kind of mindset of what that driver is like. Yeah. 
like BMW drivers are going to be assholes automatically, like just based on, I don't know, Reddit and history. Uh-huh. And then like Reddit. Mercedes or like old rich white men, sure. stuff like that. And I feel like Tesla's, do you think there's like a, like a association built with that? I think people? there used to be. Uh, I think like when it first was just so introduced and it was so new and so it was yeah. really expensive yeah, yeah, yeah. when it first came out. Uh, but now it's like at such an attainable price. And I think you'll see it all over Texas. I, I realize that a lot. Like, yeah, it's a lot of it's, it's really like tech nerdy Cali bros or something. Yeah. But I feel like now like, like it, the tax incentive, like, yeah, you're so it, dude, it's so affordable. Like, right. Now, now I see moms and families driving. in, so it's, it's good to see that. But yeah, uh, but yeah man, I think uh, we're reaching the end of this. Cool. Uh, it was an honor having you on, man. Hopefully we'll have you again soon. No, I appreciate uh, it. And I love this that you do here. I think it's really, really cool. And I'm always a big advocate. I'm a big uh, supporter. I just watch behind the scenes. Thanks, but I think man. that's great. Yeah. So before I end, I usually give the guests an opportunity to either ask me a question or ask me something that they think is worth kind of uh, bringing up on the podcast. Is there anything on your mind that you wanted to cover? Or... No, I think for us, man, we just talk a lot about like, so for me, I, I analyze everything from like a business perspective, right? Like I love business, anything, anything and all things business. Like, yeah. For you, I think we talk about a lot. It's just like dentistry and kind of having your own practice or working to meet somebody or eventually owning your own thing and then kind of employing others. And, um, I want this to be more like to turn it back on you. It's like everything that we've talked about, like what's the, where do you see your progression? Like, is that, are you still working towards that? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Another guest asked me this, like kind of similar, like where I see myself in the next couple of years. Uh, dentistry is interesting for me because I think when, when we graduate out of school, it's the same thing. Like you were taught a certain amount, but not everything that's necessary, especially financially. So we go into this field where we make a lot of money, but then we don't know what to do with it. We're not res- like, you know, we're not taught how to responsibly invest and whatnot. So that's been a lot of the the trickery around it. And then the other challenge has been trying to figure out uh, like what I want to do in the next phase of dentistry because I've been working as an associate. So it's de- dependent on where this next career path goes. Um, ideally, I wanted to own my own practice, but I know that there's a lot of uh, sacrifice that comes with that. Sure. And so with that being said, I am working on a company on the side to start uh, a company that potentially could be another pathway for me. And then also like with you, like I'm always really into the whole idea of investing in properties and sure. kind of investing into some form of passive income so that if I were to hypothetically, ideally I'm setting myself to retire by 40 if I can yeah. in dentistry. And it's not because I don't like dentistry or anything, but it's like a goal I'm setting for myself so that I can have other avenues of income yeah. and also do other things that I love. It's, um, it's so fun, dude. I, I swear we didn't plan any of this, right? So it, we'll touch base on this last thing and then we can call it. But I think you said it like retiring in your forties is your goal, right? Yeah. So I'm 33. I want to be done by 45. Yeah. So I have like a 10 to 12 year play. Um, going back to real estate and kind of what we talked about is like, people don't understand how easy it is to attain a house, right? So I have loan programs. Like I said, they're 3% down. Yeah. There's no mortgage insurance. And then my interest rate's a lot lower than the 8% that you're typically yeah. getting right now. So what I've decided to do and what I'm educating clients on is like, look, you only need 3% down. So to buy a $400,000 asset, that's going to continue to grow in value and appreciate. It costs you 12000 plus some closing costs, right? Yeah. I'm practicing this myself. I purchased my first home a year and a half ago, 3% down. In the year and a half, it's appreciated roughly $70,000. Yeah. And that's me doing nothing but living in that house, right? What do you think about the interest rates right now? Does that... I'm going to get into that too. Okay. So what I'm doing now is 3% down to buy that house, lived in it for a year and a half. It depreciated in like $70,000. Um, it's the quickest growth in money that we're doing better than any money stocks, right? And then now the, the key is it's you live in it for a year and then you can rent out now that first home and now you can buy your second home as your primary or another three percent down. Right. A lot of people don't understand is like people think to buy an investment property, you just need twenty percent down, which is true. If you're buying it solely as a rental, you need to put twenty percent down. But the caveat around that is if I purchase it as my primary home where I'm gonna be living in it for at least a year, yeah. You just have to stay in it for a year. You put three percent down, live in it for a year, you rent that thing out. So in my specific case, I put three percent down, the rent that I'm gonna be charging for it is gonna cash flow me X so for all entrance, right? right? And that's going to offset my next mortgage at this higher interest rate. Touch base on that interest rate. I don't want to sound too much about real estate and, and talk too much into it. But with interest rates, if you understand the data, meaning the cyclical nature of the interest rates and 
what dictates the interest rates like consumer price index that measures inflation data, right? You have employment data, which is your unemployment rate. Um, you have um, tenure treasury bonds, things like that. All of these factors um, affect mortgage interest rates. So if you understand right now, mortgage interest rates are at eight, so they're relatively high. That means a lot of the buyers that are typically in the pool, your competitors that are going for the same property, they're no longer there. Okay. So for us to negotiate a deal, we're getting a lot of the leverage is on our side right now in terms of the buyers, right? Sellers don't have a lot of buyers, qualified buyers to choose from. So whatever offer that comes on their table, they're more likely to entertain. Okay. Right? Understanding the nature of interest rates and the data, interest rates are going to cool off, right? As the feds are just waiting for inflation to go in the twos, right? We're at 3%. We went from 9% inflation to 3% inflation. Jerome Powell's waiting for it to get dipped into the mid twos before he starts teeter-tottering down the interest rates. But interest rates will subside and it will subside in the high fours, if not low fives. And if you understand that right now, it's the time to get a deal. You can always refinance down the line, right. lowering your mortgage rate. But what I don't want people to do is like, there's a lot of people that like their mindset is like, I'm going to wait on the sidelines when interest rates do cool off. So before I buy the issue with waiting though, is that they're going to go up and well, everyone in their everyone in their moms are waiting. Oh yeah. It's the same play. So right. if you want to wait, be feel free to wait. Yeah, interest rates will drop and you can buy it at a lower mortgage price, but the sales price, interest rates and, and home prices are always inversely related, right? During COVID, when rates dropped to 3%, which it will never go back down that low ever again, what happened was you had multiple people because now they could afford to buy it, multiple people bidding for one same home. So they were overbidding this price. They were waiving inspections, which is crazy, right? Yeah. So now is the time for you to take the time, get your inspections, negotiate the crap out of these sellers, which is what's happening right now get the deal, refinance down the line. So for example, the new house that I'm buying, um, we're doing at, at like a seven and a half interest rate, but I got majority of the closing costs paid for. And the closing cost is money out of pocket that you have to pay for right now, right? The mortgage interest rates won't be this way forever. So if I just saved $10,000 on closing costs and I just had to come down with 3%, I literally bought a house for $12,000, yeah. right? So... The mortgage for my first house, which is now going to be a rental, will offset this mortgage until interest rates cool off. I'm going to refinance, and then my mortgage rate will be a lot lower. So I want people to understand that it's, like it's really not that hard to attain a house. Yeah. Um, obviously, Austin market's a little bit different, but if you're ever in the Houston area and um, you have questions, or if you're not in the Houston area, you just have questions about real estate, uh, feel free to like DM me or just reach out to me, and I'll, I'll be a resource for you for free. And if you want to move into Houston, you want to link up and see if uh, you want to do any business together. And obviously, I want to see you here for that as well. Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, with that being said, uh, I just wanted to say thanks for coming on. Right, thanks, um, love to do business with you in the future and also sure. hang out as usual. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about Eric or wanting to reach out to him, like you said, I'm going to leave his information in the bio section. And I will also be sharing a lot of uh, reels and whatnot with his Instagram on there. So feel free to reach out to him. He's really great. He's easy to talk to. Um, and yeah, again, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for hanging out with me. And thank you for listening. Take care, guys. Bye, guys. Bye.